Hi, my name is Anthony Bellevue Flores from Rowan Imports. We're here today with David Clark, co-owner of Cooper's Craft and Kitchen in Chelsea, to talk to you about ciders for ForkandPlate.com. So with the explosion of craft cider, most people have been thinking of it like a beer. But most of the ciders that we're going to be looking at today are going to be more along the lines of a wine. We're really going to explore and see how the actual fruit that goes into it affects it. And we're going to compare it against these larger mass-produced ciders that are made from high fructose corn syrup, that are made from apple concentrates, that aren't really grown from a specific place, but mixed together, fermented quickly, and there to make a product. So when my brother and I got started importing ciders back in 2011, Asturias was the first region we went to. We found ourselves in northern Spain in this tiny principality called Asturias, which we later learned was the largest cider producing region in the world. They drink more cider in Asturias than in any other place. And what they drink is this raw, rustic, traditional cider. But to start, we're going to drink a monovarietal made by Cidra Cortina in Asturias. This is the Via Cubera, and it's made from 100% Aragona apples. So you've tried a bunch of Spanish ciders, yes. and this is a lot different it's than totally most of the ones you've had. different. I find a lot of Spanish ciders, especially from this region, can be a little bit aggressive for a first-time cider drinker. Oh, absolutely. This is far more approachable. You don't have that aggressiveness, but it still has those great Spanish cider characteristics yeah. to it. Um, and it's, it's definitely a nice introductory Spanish cider. Absolutely. Love that. Yeah. Tons of acid still, yeah. really fruity though. Uh, this Aragona, it's got a natural tendency to go malolactic. So a lot of when you think within uh, like creamier Chardonnays, they're talking about that malolactic acid fermentation and apples want to naturally go malic. So we have that in this cider and it gives it that much creamier characteristic. But that's gonna be the difference you're gonna see between say the Spanish and the UK varieties where they're not gonna be as prone to that. And does it give like a souring quality? That's, that... that's the apple that goes into it. Okay. So the rule of thumb for fruit is if you can eat it, eat it. If you can't eat it, make booze out of it. So if you have one of these in your backyard, you wouldn't eat it, you'd probably throw them at the neighbor. Just make yeah. some cider. Yeah, yeah, we'll make some cider out of it. So the next region we're going to go to is the Basque Country, just east of Asturias. They're the second largest producing region of cider in Spain, and we're going to try a traditional Spanish style from there. So opposed to this monovarietal from Asturias, we're going to try one that's a blend of the 22 certified, DOP certified varieties of apples. So they actually have a government regulation, uh, regulatory committee that says you can use these apples, you have to grow them under these conditions and ferment it under these conditions to certify it as from that. So again, think of within wine when you've got that little label around the top certifying that it's made in a certain way and that there's certain qualities to it. The Spanish follow the same thing for a cider. Now the Spanish cider is, the traditional is unfiltered. So before you drink it, you want to turn it upside down and spin it around. Uh, it's a way to get that sediment to then move throughout. Because these are made, it's a 20,000 liter barrel where they just press the apples while they macerate them, press them, put them in the barrels, allow them to ferment naturally for three to six months, and then unfiltered, they put it straight into the bottle. Traditionally, you go to the agar and you drink it straight from the barrel. So you just go right up to the barrel, you tap it, and it shoots about 10 feet out. You just catch it with your glass. So if Dave lets us, we can pour it traditionally. Go ahead. We're doing it? <laughs> Let's okay. do it. All right, so the traditional Spanish style cider is drunk in the escanciador style. So they take the glass, which is normally a wide rim glass, which makes this a lot easier. They <laughs> hold it by their waist, and then they take the bottle, and they hold it up above their head, and they pour it like this. This is called un culin, or a little ass, and then you drink the whole glass. Now I'm gonna pour it still so you can see the difference between them. Completely changed. Yeah. Can't get over that. Because the way you were traditionally pouring it, it's far more easier to drink. There's not that harshness there on mm -hmm. it. There's definitely a lot more acidity when you just pour it straight like that. Why Absolutely. is that? That acid, it gets broken up. So think of when you're, when you're carbonating something. Okay. Easiest way to test this out is take a beer, open it, let it sit for a couple hours, and then drink it after that carbonation is dissipated. Nothing's actually chemically changed in the beer, but by losing that carbonation, that acid is, is just more heavy, it's more present in it. And for a Spanish cider that has so much of that volatile acidity in there, yeah. it really gets back into it and you taste that so much more. Wow. Um, and it's just a lot of fun. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> that's the end fun. Yeah, that's the end fun. <laughs>
Uh, so the next cider we're gonna try, now that we've finished with the Spanish, we're gonna go to New York. So New York, my home state, is makes some of the best cider that I've ever had, but it's not the commercial ciders that you've tried. So the first one that we're gonna try, this is the Orchard Hill. So it's grown from uh, Soon's Apples, which is one of the most well-respected orchards in the Hudson Valley. And then it is fermented out at Sparkling Point, which is one of the most well-regarded uh, Method Champenois uh, wineries that you're going to find on the North Fork of Long Island. Uh, this is not disgorged, so you're gonna get a lot of cloudiness back in there. And this is actually mostly made from dessert fruits, so you're not gonna get that same really astringent, acidic characteristic that we did in the Spanish. Should we try? Yes, sounds great. Again, it's like drinking a totally different product when we move from Spain to New York. Absolutely. Obviously, it's all apples, but just the difference in those apples and the ciders is absolutely mind-blowing. So the next cider we're going to have is the Slybro Hidden Star, which is one of our favorite ciders. Dave and I have drunk this a number of times. Too many times. Yeah. <laughs> no, definitely not too many. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Slybro is from upstate New York. It's from Granville, New York, about two hours north of Albany. Uh, cell phone service cuts out about a half hour before you get there, so it is really up north. So Slybro is a, is a great story of New York craft ciders. They're the oldest U-Pick orchard, and they've been growing apples uh, for the local market for a long time. And they were making cider out of the few cider apple trees that they had on their property just for themselves, and people really liked it. So they started making more of it, planting more of the trees, and now Slybro is, is doing very well for them. Um, it? Very good. Cheers. Yep. Absolute perfection. I always say if I was stranded on a desert island and I had a cider to bring with me 100% every time, that's going to be it. I think yeah. it's everything that I want in a cider. It's, again, it's clean, it's sharp. There's just, it's, it's, it's just a pure cider in my opinion. So this is a blend of Liberties and Northern Spies, which are those crossover apples where they're not nearly as tart and tannic as the Spanish and the English varieties, but they're not sweet or cloying like most mass-produced ciders. So it's got that great balance of clean, crisp, sharp, with that little bit of residual sugar to it as well, as well as light carbonation that it's really, you could drink it on a desert island. Definitely. So the next cider we're gonna try is the Longville from County Cork in Ireland. This is a true artisanal cider where they initially were fermenting the cider to make a brandy out of it. But in this recent generation, William took over and kept that cider and has been reintroducing it to people. Uh, he's also making almost a pomo style where he takes his brandy and puts some back into the cider and it gets to around 20% alcohol, but still has that really rich flavor of the original apple cider with a little bit more spice to it on top of it. So again, tasting that, there's a huge difference between the Spanish New York and then definitely Irish. Is that down to the apple varietals? There's a lot of different varietals in the Irish than there would be in the New York? Absolutely. So each, each area has its main workhorse of an apple. Uh, in Spain, we have the Vergona. In the United States, it all varies by region. Uh, the same in uh, the UK, you're going to have Dabinets, Michelins, and then Bramleys. So the last cider we're gonna try is the Cidre de Rui. It's by Cidreia Nicole, and they're in Brittany in Western France. So there are two re major regions of cider production in France. There is Brittany and Normandy. Most people know Normandy. Uh, I like the Breton cider because it has more of the Guyavec apple in it, which I find gives it a little bit more of that caramelized flavor to it. But we're gonna talk about uh, the, the flavor profile and the production of French cider, which is certainly unique as far as cider goes. So the way the French produce their cider is a process called keeving. Keeving is the American or English word for it. Uh, the French word is going to be defecation. In Northern France, you have a high level of salt in the soil. And when that mixes with the high level of pectin in the apples, they have this process, which they uh, refer to as defecation, where the, uh, the salt and the pectin interact and gelatinizes the barrel. That barrel, when it rises to the top, it pulls the nutrients out of the juice and has a reductive fermentation. So when you taste that, you got that really sulfuric note to it on the nose. Definitely, there's a lot more apple skin yeah. rather than the body of an apple. That's what I'm getting off that. And that's from that production. It's the only place that does that. There's a couple Americans that try to do it. Uh, there's an, Eng uh, an Englishman who does it. There's also an Irishman. But for the most part, it's, it's really just in Northern France that they do that. So here at Cooper's Craft and Kitchen, we do have 28 draft lines. Um, 24 of those lines are for craft beers. We also have four cider lines that are exclusively for ciders. We actually make our own 
house beer. So I had an idea about making a house cider as well. I don't believe anybody else is really doing it and I think it's something interesting for us and it's definitely something interesting for the, for the customer. So I approached Anthony many months ago about the possibility of doing a cider and uh, he's reached out to some great, great Irish cideries. And this is the first batch that we've, uh, our first sample batch basically that we've had and it's tasting absolutely great. So what we want to do is just bring on that cider program and uh, have an amazing tasting Irish cider and just change people's perceptions on cider and just get them involved in enhancing their taste buds and just trying all these different, different types of cider that we do carry at Cooper's Craft and Kitchen. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoy learning about the world of cider. And we're here today with David Clark from Cooper's Craft and Kitchen in Chelsea. Uh, brought, oh, fuck. <laughs> I was gonna say, brought you by fork and plate. <laughs> we're here today with David Clark from Cooper's Craft and Kitchen in Chelsea to talk to you about ciders with fork, fork and plate. Fucking, fucking. <laughs> That's so close. <laughs> I got, there's literally, we hired a new manager and she's starting today at four o'clock. Yeah. So I'm literally very worried that I'm going to be very drunk. Throw it to the wall. We'll go over there. Introduction to her. I'd be like, hello. We got, we got a real drunk. <laughs> yeah. Who is this guy? <laughs> Why am I working for him? <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever seen a Spaniard? They're like super, I mean, they look like me. You know, you're like really <laughs> lean, you drink, drink way too much, eat a lot of cured meats, they smoke <laughs> way too many cigarettes. Awesome. They're amazing. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. They, live they, live till, they, they live till like they're 110. Yeah. Yeah. They're just like, at least. Just old yeah. people sitting there just smoking yeah. cigarettes, just eating meat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, last time I was there, I ordered a salad because I was like, I need some vegetables. Yeah, yeah. It was just a leaf of lettuce with a steak and melted cheese <laughs> on top. <laughs> How the fuck is this a salad? Yeah. <laughs> you know, apples are from Kazakhstan originally. Yeah, no. So there's this giant apple forest there. And he was just like, come to Kazakhstan. Go, go ride the goats through the apple orchard. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it kind of smells like um, after you're intimate with somebody, you get a little bit of that kind of sweat going on. So <laughs> he was, yeah, no, no. So we, we were calling it uh, people who like each other. Uh, P W L E O, and so we just started saying that, and we started getting people to repeat that, and so now you like go to terroir, and they'll just be like, some lovely P W L E O on that. <laughs> By the way, defecation means shit. <laughs> you go, you do yours. No, <laughs> it's your taste. You know what do you mean, my I taste? Told you. I came here, I came up for you to do this. <laughs>